Are you interested in making games? What about social media for free marketing? Or even converting that into free money? If so, welcome to the wonderful world of game developer content creation. This talk brought to you by... Hey everyone, welcome to this talk. My name is Adam. And uh, today I'm going to be chatting with you about making games and marketing them while you make them and trying to maybe even turn that into a revenue source so that marketing the game can pay for the game. It's a win-win. So I'm 32. I have a degree in design from the University of Sydney here in Australia. I uh, spent a few years as a user experience designer where I worked at an agency and then as a contractor before becoming a game developer and now, of course, content creator while I do game development. So hopefully I'm a good person to be giving you this speech because I, I do the thing that I'm talking about. So I'm making this game called Insignia. Uh, it's a side-scrolling action game and it's something that I do on stream every day. I've been working on this game for seven years and I'm right in the middle of getting some funding for this game as well. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to spend this much time on it or get it as far as I have if it wasn't for being able to market the game while I build it and have a revenue source in content creation. So I am doing the thing that this video is talking about and for all intents and purposes, the game that I'm making is only in a position to be developed and released successfully at the scale that I'm working on it because of this opportunity that I have. There may be other pathways, but this is the path that I've been on since 2018. So those of you who know the channel know that I operate under the brand Indie Tales. This is Adam C. Eunice's brand, this is who I am. I have a YouTube channel, I have a stream on Twitch, and of course, uh, I have a Discord where everyone who uh, watches the content comes together and shares knowledge about what they're learning and shares their work and gives feedback, and it's really cool. The content itself is basically game dev related, focused around education with a side of following my journey as I build Insignia. So I talk about lessons that I've learned, I do time lapses, vlogs, essays, all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, I've been doing that on YouTube at least since 2019, started streaming in 2018. At the moment, this is what everything looks like. So I'm at five years of, you know, solid content creation. The YouTube channel as of recording is at 235K subs. We've got 41K followers on Twitch. We've got 8K members on Discord and a hundred paying patrons and about 400 more who have paid or intermittently donate, you know, when it suits them, which is great. So currently that's covering my personal costs of living while I'm working on Insignia. So I have a partner, she works uh, in law as a paralegal at the moment, soon to be a lawyer. And between the two of us working kind of part-time, uh, we're able to just scrape by renting uh, while we get this stuff going. Of course, we live in Sydney, which is one of the most expensive cities in the world. So uh, take it with a grain of salt. So that's how I live. I didn't start this way. Obviously I was doing mostly user experience design contracts part-time while starting the content creation stuff. And I've built up from there. So let's get into it. How did it all start? So look, I've always wanted to make games. It's been a big thing for me forever. And um, at the end of 2016, after a few false starts with YouTube and doing bits and pieces while I was at my job doing UX design, I really wanted to start working on a game project before I got like too old or whatever. Uh, so I promised myself that I'd go to PAX in 2017, that I would take a demo of the game there and I would build a following throughout the development. And I did. 2017, I was at PAX and um, had a lot of a lot of eyes on the game and have been working on it since. So first question is like, why social media? Like what was I trying to achieve by having an audience in the first place? So PAX was a great place to, uh, you know, get opportunities for networking, but didn't do great for exposure overall. I mean, this is real life. You're only limited to how many people you can speak to in a day versus the internet where people can see your work in the millions if you're lucky. I knew that I wanted there to be some kind of long-term growth for the game while I worked on it. I wanted the game to have some hype behind it by the time it released. And um, yeah, so I started posting stuff online. I started on my journey with Reddit. So basically this was my way of just posting to a place where I knew my content was welcome. Uh, mostly it was work in progress, pixel art stuff, getting feedback. Soon it became more showcasey stuff, just like showing what I was capable of. And the more that I geared towards like being really, really impressive and making complex and cool pixel art animated stuff, uh, the more attention I got. And soon I was like, you know, sitting at the top 
of the R Pixel Art subreddit every time I'd post. And uh, the game was, you know, getting a little bit of attention there, although it's a small community. So, so not a bad place to start, but you know, I started thinking about more like calls to action. So when you make a post and it has no additional links or anything for anyone to go to, then that's just the end of it. But I was thinking, well, I want people to know more about my game, not just the, the pretty pictures that I'm posting. So I started streaming on Twitch because Australia's internet became good enough for us to do that. So I was streaming and I was posting a demo on itch.io very soon from PAX. So I was starting to direct people towards pages for the game and for my development that they could go to. And this is really important when you're posting on social media. So that's what I was doing. Then obviously Twitch is something that I even do today. I always wanted to stream. I just like the idea of bringing people along for the journey. It was something that I had no reason not to do because I was going to be working on the game every day anyway. That was just something that I was happy to do and to build the skills doing because I wanted to be able to have those presentation skills, which I've now had a lot of practice at. Um, so by the second year, I had like 40 average viewers. Uh, it's not a huge amount of viewers, but on Twitch for game dev specifically, the community is very small. So I started to get a bit of a plateau there and not be able to see much growth organically through Twitch. This then kind of incentivized me to look outside. So basically I noticed there were a couple of Twitch streamers who you may know today who have a big platform and I noticed that they were doing more stuff on YouTube. Uh, and so I thought, you know, I'll just start posting stuff on YouTube and see how things go. So that's what I did. I started posting on YouTube. I didn't really know exactly what the channel would be. I wanted it to be a place where I posted my Twitch content at first. I was like, oh yeah, I'll just do highlights or whatever. Um, but I knew that more targeted content would be maybe better for discovery. So tutorials, that kind of thing that people are actually looking for. And true enough, that content did way, way better. Like stuff that people want to know about is how you reach them. If you can give them something that you want them to see along with stuff that they want to see, then that's kind of like a fair exchange of value. So tutorials with a little bit of work in progress for my game seemed to be a really good way to sort of uh, meet both ends. But I was hoping eventually to focus more on the game, which I've still mostly done, but it's a give and take. So TikTok and short form video is now probably the highest uh, growth in terms of video content. But uh, for me, like I found this content really easy to produce, but I found it really exhausting because it tends to have much less to do with my game when I'm posting content about it and more to do with uh, highlights from my Twitch stream, which is good promotion, but has nothing to do really with my initial foray into social media, which was to promote the game. So this is kind of like where it all leaded me, right? Uh, smaller more niche, more enthusiast driven platforms like Reddit and Discords. Really good place to get started because you're talking about your games directly and you're talking to people who want to see your content. As you go to bigger, more, I guess, normy centric platforms, uh, you kind of lose the source a little bit unless what you're doing is like really, really uh, ready for people to see. So you can almost think of the bottom as like enthusiast and the top as like consumer. It's quite hard to go into the sort of very high volume content if you don't have a lot to say all the time. And my content certainly is uh, the kind of content that tends to be more contemplative, more educational, which um, is harder to do well on TikTok. So I experienced a little bit of content burnout and even on YouTube, I, I do feel this. My passion is about being educational, turning my experience into something valuable for you. And platforms that focus on more short form media, more attention grabby stuff, you need to work a lot harder. And for me, it also felt a lot more like a job than just sharing my story, which to me is a lot more enjoyable. And of course it did become a job and it felt like a job. So at what point did it become a job? A lot of the people that I met in 2017 at PAX, who I've seen in the time since, have asked me like, hey, so are you still a dev? Are you still working on the game? Or are you just doing content creation now? Uh, because they've seen my tutorials, they're aware that I have a presence. This is a fair question. Uh, and of course, like primarily I do just do dev, especially on Twitch, like I'm just working and sharing what I'm working on. Um, but as a job, there are some pressures that do push you away from doing what you want to do when it comes to content creation 
and revenue. So this all sort of happened organically and it was very automatic that once the Twitch stream and the YouTube channel started taking off, that they had some revenue coming in. And once that was appreciable, like part of my, you know, monthly finances, it was something that seemed organically like it needed to be a priority of mine. Like if I can make this grow bigger, then it can fund my whole development. So I should also focus on making this grow, right? This is now my job. But of course there is a distinction here, right? Like I mentioned between game promo and self promo. So it's awesome when what you're making can be shared really easily and really frequently for people to get excited about. If you can reach your audience that way, that's awesome. But the pressure to produce more content more quickly is easier to satisfy if you don't have a dependency on the game like reaction content, gameplay content instead of game dev content is all easier to produce than actually making something and then sharing something about it every day. Uh, I don't do that stuff, which is why I struggle to make content more frequently. So let's look at some pros and cons of at least my experience doing game development content creation. The pros. First is insight. One, you get lots of regular productive feedback. If you're on camera and you've got a lot of people watching, they want to see you succeed. Uh, it also forces introspection. So like as a developer, how to improve, how to optimize. It's something that you're constantly vigilant about how things are going for you and you are motivated to do it better because you have people that are watching, right? Uh, it also helps archive your journey. I have hard drives with like, like hundreds and hundreds of episodes of my Twitch stream. If I need to source any of it to see what I was doing at a certain time or just to like check my progress, uh, I can do that, which is something that not many people can do. Maybe with the new uh, Copilot PCs, that's something that Microsoft will be doing for you in the next couple of years, being able to save every single second of every single thing you ever do. But uh, I've been doing it since 2018 and uh, I do it offline. So it's all secure and private for now. Finally, it's also like free tech support. Like people will like just tell you how to do stuff that you don't know how to do, uh, which is great as well. Freedom is another big pro. So one is that it gave me the time to pursue my interests as a developer, like a hobbyist, without sacrificing any IP or creative interest, right? I didn't have to pitch to somebody who then got to own 50% of everything that I did uh, in order to get started. I just got to spend all my time working on my game, which is cool. Also, they allowed me to earn money while staying in the one creative game development headspace, which is really important. Like if you've ever tried to work a full-time job or even a part-time job and do game dev on the side, one of the things that's really difficult is context switching. So going from like spending three or four hours thinking about one thing and then trying to switch into the other thing, you don't just get those two chunks of time back to back. There's like a burnout period where you kind of like need to sort of get adjusted back into the thing that you were thinking of the last time you were thinking about it. So that is something that I can afford not to do as a content creator. Another pro is visibility. Of course, the marketing side is real. You do get to market your game in a way for free. It doesn't cost real dollars to do it, although it does cost a lot of time. Uh, it's also kind of nice to be known online sometimes, you know, it helps me meet people who already know who I am and that's uh, easy for my social anxiety. Uh, it also creates a sense of motivation and community in having a following who actively care about what you do. So obviously I've got the Pixel Pals here on the channels and they're very supportive and it feels like you have to show up for them. That's really motivating to like pick up the torch every day and you know run that little extra distance because you know people are asking like, hey, are you streaming today? Like, oh, it's been a while, like we miss you. So that's nice. Now let's talk about the cons. Cons are real and I want to focus on them. So the first big con is how much of an investment it is. Even if it's not a monetary investment, the time is huge and you have no guaranteed revenue at the start. You might be doing this stuff for a year before anything happens. Another one is, yeah, it's time consuming. Even if you're just sharing your work, just posting on X or Instagram or whatever is time consuming. And if you work for a good portion of the day, it's hard to spend another half an hour making a post and editing it, making sure it's right, writing the description, posting it, checking analytics and making sure people can see it and reposting it to other places. It's not easy. Another one is sustaining the revenue source requires a continued investment. It's not just do this every day and then, you know, build it and they will come. Sometimes it's like, you gotta keep going. If you stop building, they won't come. Another one is 
uh, that sharing a part of yourself online routinely does take a toll that other jobs don't. So yeah, it's not like all roses. You do have to put the time in and you, you kind of have to keep putting the time in to get something out, especially at the beginning. Another big con is misdirection. So it's really easy to get lost chasing the algorithm instead of focusing on what makes the game fun. So the algorithm is the thing that's going to give you all the feedback. It's going to tell you the impressions, the clicks, it's going to tell you the likes. It's not going to tell you whether or not your game is fun. And nothing will tell you that the game is fun or that you're going to make it unless you're doing playtesting, which is something that costs a lot more, a lot more time and energy to do that. So the pressure of making the algorithm happy as a substitute for making the game good is something that happens for sure. You also have to be responsible for filtering the feedback. So even though you get a lot of feedback and you might have people who are well-meaning, sometimes they're not well-meaning, you know, people say nasty things or people say unhelpful things. That happens and you have to be the one to decide what you need to listen to and you need to protect yourself from that where necessary without being biased against the feedback. So that's hard too. Another huge one is insecurity. So even if you've put all the time into it and you have some stable revenue, sometimes the content just comes up a dud for the algorithm and it just starts biasing against you. And that affects your actual paycheck at the end of the month, which is tough. Also like being online turns you into a business. It's very hard to separate the feelings that happen when you fail to generate growth in your revenue month to month versus you being a bad person. It can feel that way sometimes. And, um, and because again, one is concrete data and the other one is just your own self worth, it's hard to weigh one against the other. So of course, then the pressure to change yourself to become more marketable is super considerable and the mental health implications should not be understated. I really, really, really want you, if you are considering getting into this line of work to appreciate how important this point is. Like if you have seen what Instagram does to people and what doom scrolling does, imagine if that's also your job. The pressure is really, really high. And sometimes like it's hard to not compare yourself. The imposter syndrome involved in like posting your work online and comparing it to everybody else's around you is one thing. Having your face be a part of that and your voice, the way you look, the way that you emote in your day to day or the way that you look while you're working, just like in your resting face, those things matter to some degree that's unknown to you, to the algorithm and the pressure to like change it when things aren't working out, especially uh, is really high, especially when you see other people doing really, really well online. You think, well, what are they doing right that I'm doing wrong? And what do I have to change to do what they're doing right? So please don't underestimate that. That's like really huge. I have seen a psychologist while doing the content creation stuff. It's helped a lot, but like it's a struggle. So this question is one that I ask myself. I don't know if you would be asking this of me. You might assume that I am, but am I successful? I'm going to be transparent here. I'm going to show you the real numbers, how much I work and what I make. So in a week, you know, I might spend 60 hours working in total. I kind of just live this stuff. I try to have a social life too, but like, it's not always like that. So I do dev on Twitch. I would call that like 50, 50 content creation versus game dev. I'm definitely not as productive as I would be, but also like I am working. Then there's probably like 15 hours a week in the morning that I spend on dev at a good week. Um, and then obviously like every week, there's about 12 hours of new videos. Sometimes it's every two weeks, sometimes it's once a month. So that can diminish too. But if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, uh, it tends to be about 12 hours a week. And then management, like this stuff turns into a business. You gotta be sending emails. You gotta be managing your community stuff. You gotta be uh, on top of responding to comments. It's, it's not nothing. So about an hour a day. Then we can look at revenue breakdown. So this, I can talk you through a little bit. For me right now, each of these different revenue streams earns me about 250 Australian dollars per week. So it's about $3,000 a month that I'm working with. Um, cross, it's, it's not even between the two. Twitch tends to be a little bit better and you can kind of push a little harder on Twitch um, month to month because people are actually subscribing to you right directly. It's a bit of a more concentrated revenue stream. YouTube is probably more stable. Twitch has the higher earning potential. Patreon tends to be stable again, but you have to keep at it. And um, 
it's more just like a tertiary thing for people who are like super fans and really want to support you directly. This figure has grown year on year. So this Y axis here is in thousands of dollars, Australian dollars. Um, you know, in the first couple of years, I wasn't making nearly enough money to do anything with it, but maybe by like 2021, 2022, I was taking this stuff more seriously and I was seeing like real growth. And nowadays, by 2024, things have kind of plateaued off a little bit. So this is my full-time thing, but I would say proportionate to this graph, every year that falls below 30, you can think of the number that would make it 30 as the amount of time that I spent uh, working contracts. So in 2018 and 2019, I spent like six months doing contract work. Um, by 2021, it was like two or three months in the year. And last year it was like a month of part-time contract work. This year I haven't done any contract work. So in Australia, in Sydney, that's kind of like the bare minimum, about $30,000 a year to like live and have a car and insurance and all that stuff. Um, especially if you have a partner, you know, $60,000 a year for a household income is very, very low in Sydney. But um, yeah, just making it work. So the question is, where does it go from here? Now, unfortunately, like I said, my revenue growth opportunities are mostly limited. Like I can't make this thing go up by spending double the amount of time because I'm spending full time, right? I can change things. I can try to push a little harder, but that obviously comes with a bit more burnout. And um, of course the game does require a bit more concentrated effort now that I'm in a position where I'm doing like explicit um, search for funding opportunities thinking about publishers in a few months, I have to be spending more time offline doing that stuff. Uh, and so content creation, you know, it's, it's limited for me. Particularly, I would say that content creation for me is like a job, not a business. So like as far as jobs go, it's like a part-time thing, it feels like. Other game dev content creators, like the most successful ones on YouTube, they might be making more to the point where they can reinvest back into the content creation by hiring an editor, getting producers on board, maybe hiring community managers so that they're not doing much of that stuff at all. Maybe hiring an agent, you know, if things are going crazy. That kind of stuff allows you as the brand to transition, to spend most of your time back on the, on the stuff that you want to do. So like making games and then the content creation engine can be clipping that stuff and turning it into videos and making sure that there's an upload every day. You really have to have a team. Um, and for me, unfortunately, it's just never really capped above that point where I could invest that extra above my cost of living. So this one will apply to everybody. There is a little bit of a question around whether or not your content creation, if it's successful, represents your player base. So there will be a conversion rate for everything. And I think you can expect that number to be less than one. So how many people are actually going to buy your game, even though they like your content? That number is gonna sort of decide everything. And for me, obviously as a game developer first, I really want that number to be higher. And I would hope, you know, long-term that all of this effort that I put into paid off in game sales more than just followers or, you know, streaming revenue or YouTube revenue, that stuff is, was always secondary to me. There's also a really, really important question of fit. So like my game is like story driven and it's got a long development cycle and that makes content creation harder. There are other styles out there and other games that could be used to try this whole content creation thing. So, you know, if you're making smaller games more frequently, maybe you can have like a recurring player base out of that or a game that's like iteratively scaling through early access where there are multiple releases coming out every six weeks or so and people are actually able to stay invested in the game as a product and the content creation kind of serves as marketing for that continuously, then maybe that would allow for the content creation to happen a little bit better. There are of course intangibles, things that I can't measure, but that I can at least identify. So there are opportunities that I've had, networking opportunities, marketing opportunities that have come to me through the game that I might not even realize at this point are only there because of my content creation. I've definitely met people that I wouldn't have otherwise met and had things like sponsorships come through that pad out some of that income. But the value of these things on the success of the game, which is the primary thing, still TBD. So on that topic of sponsorships, of course, sponsorships are definitely an opportunity to elevate your revenue. 
uh, and they will range in relevance and value to your actual uh, project and things that you've got going on. Most of those things, however, will have nothing to do with what you care about uh, and will pay very little. So NordVPN, Raid Shadow Legends, they will be there if you're making content. So there will be lots of sponsors, but only some of them will be actually worth taking on unless you've got a lot of time on your hands. Um, for me, I would say like the ideal sponsorship is one where you already care about the thing that you're marketing for these people, right? If you already use their service or you are actually genuinely interested in some product that they have, then it doesn't feel like work. And that's the only time that it's not, right? So I had a sponsorship earlier this year to work with Game Maker to do a game jam. I do game jams every six months. I've been doing game jams in new engines that I've never tried before since last year. So the idea of doing what I was already doing with Game Maker as a sponsor was a perfect fit for you know my content and my audience. That's the only time I would say it's like really a win-win. Otherwise, it's just a job, just like every other job. So now you know about me and about my journey and what's worked and what hasn't for me. What do I think are the criteria for whether this is right or wrong for you? The first is like, what is success? You have to identify what it is that you want out of this journey. Because if you don't, you'll just go where the wind takes you. If you understand what your goals are, what your opportunity is, and what your time frame is, then at the very least, you can prioritize them. So it's less about deadlines and more about like, what do you care about? Like, if you go on this journey and five years later, you haven't made any money, will you still be happy? with making the content. So you have to be, you know, self-reflective and ask yourself like, is there actually a condition in your mind, in your heart that says like, hey, I'm young now, five years from now, will I still wanna be doing this? Do I expect something from this? And then you can think about how you're gonna actually get there and when it is time to pivot or do something different. The next question is like, is it right for you? Like you as a person. So I think like if you're young, if you're in like university, say, you have a lot of talent, a good on-screen persona, or you want to build one, uh, maybe you'll be able to generate like a sizable following by the time you graduate. This is like a three to five year thing that you're going to get into if you're going to do this. Especially like if you live with your parents and you don't pay rent, then I would say maybe it's worth investing the energy because you have time, you don't have money. So building an audience takes that. And uh, that's probably the point in your life where you have the most of it to invest. Obviously, different cultures around the world people grow up and have different lifestyles and um, I can't speak for you but in Australia at least that's kind of the portrait of someone I would paint who I would think would be a good candidate for doing content creation someone young with not a lot of responsibility but a lot of time and a lot of kind of excitement and enthusiasm for this kind of walk of life next is is your game a good fit I mentioned this a little bit earlier if you're making a game that's very systems heavy Maybe one that has like emergent, fun, surprising things you can post very often about that don't get stale. That totally works. For me, like being a story-based game with a lot of handcrafted pixel art, a lot of the value of my game is kind of baked into the play experience. So you have to kind of play the game for like an hour before you're like fully in the world. If I show you some bush that I drew, you've seen the bush now. I can't post about that every day. If I show you some music that's in the game or a cutscene, you've seen the cutscene once, I can't keep mining that for content. But if it's a more of a systems-based game, you've got you know units running around and cool, interesting, fun stuff can happen, especially if you have people playing in your game, play testing it, that's great. That's good stuff for content, you can mine that. Understand the factors that go into making content for your game and marketing your game. I actually think Stardew Valley would have been an awesome example for a game to be created alongside content creation or to have a content creation kind of presence. One is that the game is very easy to impose yourself into as a player and to make original. So original content is something that players can create just by playing the game. No two farms are the same. Uh, everyone can romance different characters. And so it doesn't tire because there are those procedural emergent aspects of the gameplay. Uh, another one is that the game has iterative updates. So you can have new announcements, you can have people playing in the game before it's finished, and then six months from now, you can have a brand new thing that you're adding and people can get hyped while playing the game for the new features that are coming out soon. Having multiple releases for a game with lots of systems that allow for personalization is, I think, kind of like the ideal 
bed, right? That's like uh, the forest that's very dry on a summer, right? The fire is ready to be lit. I also wouldn't discount gimmicks. So not every game is like a book. Some games are more like toys or have some unique novel thing that no one's ever seen before. If you have a really unique art style or you have some mechanic that is totally original that uh, people just want to tell other people about, then yeah, that does really well in social media too. Uh, and sometimes you really need that one post to be the marketing force behind the game, especially if it's a smaller game. Something like Townscaper, which did really well on Twitter, is the kind of game where I think it doesn't even have to be a game, but the experience of building your little seaside town by clicking and dragging around and just seeing it build up, there's something about that that just communicates itself as being fun that doesn't really need to be explained any further. And I think that it's really important to understand the intersection here between games being valuable and games being marketable and the right marketing platform for the game. I'm not saying you should make Stardew Valley or Townscaper just because they market well on social media. What I am saying is if you're looking to get into social media and content creation, think about the kind of game that you've got and adjust your expectations accordingly. There are way cooler, different other ways to market different kind of games. If you have a story-based game, you can find a traditional publisher that does that kind of stuff, much like a book publisher, who will take the necessary steps to get your game in front of the big platforms to make sure that it gets the spotlight on release. That's a different way to do it and um, something that I'm exploring in my own time. The next question is like, does it have to be a job? The answer to this is certainly no. Anything that you do to generate revenue is going to grant you the opportunity to work on your side projects in your free time, right? You don't have to do game dev content creation as a job. And additionally, anything that doesn't add to your game success isn't really game development. It's not even game marketing if it has nothing to do with your game. So there's no reason to be biased in favor of content creation if it creates less opportunity for you. This is like the real point here. Like if you're okay and interested with having like a presence online, that's fine. And the things that you do to further that are cool as like a side quest to the game development stuff. But if you're just being honest about like being a game developer and making stuff for your game to market it, then, you know, it's harder to justify those extra side questy stuff, the videos that have nothing to do with your game um, or the posts that are, you know, humorous or that are just there to sort of like get people's attention, like that stuff, maybe there's some crossover, but for me at least, I guess I'm trying to say that for sure, you don't need to do that stuff. Like there are lots of developers out there who weren't doing content creation, solo indies that have made hugely successful games that didn't have their face as a big part of the game's marketing. So just something to think about. You know, you don't have to do this stuff. You can just wait until you've got something to actually market. And then around the time you're trying to sell it, put more energy and effort or money into having somebody else market it for you. And that's it. Thank you so much. This was my talk on game dev content creation. If you have questions, I'm going to be here. I'm going to see them. So post them in the comments. I gave this talk at the University of New South Wales a couple of days ago to a room of like huh, 10 people. It was like their game dev society asked me to come out and speak to them. And so I put together this little presentation and uh, it went really well. They were all really sweet. And uh, I would love to stay in touch with the people that I met there because they were all very passionate and making games in their own way. This is like something that for me, I want to be able to tell you what to do, <laughs> but the world is changing so quickly. There are so many different ways of doing things. All I can do really is share with you my experience and be informative about the reality of how this has gone. If I'm being honest, I would say it has been a success. There have been clutch things that have happened in the very recent history that I can't talk about that probably were made way, way better by the fact that I had the experience of being a content creator. I also have experience doing user experience design, putting together presentations, making pitches to clients. Life experience is useful. So it's hard to say whether it's like content creation that's helping me here or like just being older 
being wiser, having had experience being in the professional world. So I'm going to let you take that data and do whatever it is that you need to do with it. If you're the kind of person who won't be told, then you won't be told. So enjoy. Just uh, be warned, you know, it's not all roses. So yeah, that's the talk. I wish I could waffle on for a bit more. If this was on stream, which I do every weekday, I would be talking for another 45 minutes about this subject, and I probably will on Monday. So join us at twitch.tv slash Adam C. Eunice. I'll see you there. Thank you so much, as always.